Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan Emmis, Pitts, Ukraine War Frontline update for the 6th of July 2024, just off the back of England narrowly beating Switzerland 2-1 in the Euro 2024 quarterfinals. Uh, Saka scored this amazing goal that I missed live because I was too busy vacuuming crushed Solvinger Pringles from under my fat ass and uh, superb goal, missed it live, gutted. Anyway, uh, we just squeezed through on penalties and we just don't seem to have turned up uh, in in this match, at, in this tournament so far at all. So anyway, for those who care about that, th those are my opinions. Uh, let's get on with the mapping. So we'll go to, if you don't want the lines mean on that map, please pause the video and check out the key on the screen. We're going to go to that northern area of the Kharkiv Oblast and this third sector that's been opened up to the northwest of Kharkiv City. And this is odd because I showed Syriac maps having this increase uh, over the last couple of days. This is a two-day update again today, I think. I don't think I did it yesterday, which means there are a few more pins than, than, than normally. It would be these sort of double movements in some areas. Uh, but yes, Syriac maps showed that the Russians had uh, attacked into this third sector. Deep State map now catching up with that. Um, this is something of a worry, I guess, but it's more should be more of a worry for the Russians because only what was it a week ago the Americans said if there is an expansion to the particularly the Kharkiv um, attack zone then that would justify Ukraine striking beyond 100 kilometers into Russian territory in other words if they open up a further sector along this front line then Ukraine can hit Russian air bases with high Mars 300 kilometer ATACMs. Seemed to be the implication. And then a couple of days later, Russia decided to do this. So not quite sure whether this is wise and actually whether Ukraine are going to follow through with that, whether this definitely does justify such um, a retaliation. But anyway, the Russians have moved into that area as according to two mappers now. Andrew Perpetua hasn't mapped there yet. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, not too much information there. Uh, I'm, although I'm not going into the ISW just for time constraints for me today. So that is there. We're going to go to the north northern um, sector, the one just north of Kharkiv, around Lyubike here, just north of Lipsy. And the Surat maps has the most, uh, I guess, uh, charitable to Ukraine scenario here. So Ukraine have counterattacked in Lyubike and according to Syriac maps pushed the uh, Russians back there. Although they have a tweet going along with this, like as you can see there, that's where they're pushing back. The text is the wrong text. So that's for another part of the front line. I don't really know what's going on there. Anyway, Ukrainians seem to be uh, fighting back in that sector. It, no report says... Incoming reports that Ukraine has liberated the northern part of Lyubike and Kharkiv region, waiting for confirmation. And then here we have another source, Sharky, here saying advancement of the UAF in the settlement of Lyubike. The counterattack took place in the area of the farm north of the village, 1.22 uh, square kilometers, has been liberated, liberated. So those agricultural buildings just around here uh, that the Ukrainians are fighting in at the moment. So good news to the Ukrainians there. They are also seeming to have some success in the Vovchansk area. So this larger or this wider northeastern sector uh, going from Staritsia across to past uh, Vovchansk has seen, uh, according to Syriac maps, the, the Ukrainians push the Russians back quite a bit. Uh, I think Syriac maps is catching up with data around here to suggest that, yeah, okay, the Russians don't control all of this area that they had previously said that no one else agreed with. If we go, uh, well, actually, no, before we go to Vodchansk, uh, let me just tell you about a counterattack. That counterattack around Lyubike well, actually a Russian uh, mechanized attack that seems to have gone alongside this, possibly trying to defend against this push by the Ukrainians. Sorry to flip around a bit, but I forgot that I had a had a little section in Andrew Perpetua's live stream from last night. Himself and Gick are talking about uh, that area. To bucket, um, I think. What we saw yesterday was one of the first, more or less, um, really um, major um, mechanized uh, attacks here in this area. So far, we have mostly seen infantry. Russia did lose quite some vehicles, but typically you would see them lose, you know, a vehicle here and there. Um, and this attack, however, was definitely coordinated. It was uh, something like four 
Um, it's claimed that it was actually a total of five, but I think we only saw visual evidence of four, or four uh, vehicles. Um, we see four of them destroyed and pretty much two kilo uh, kilometers out from the front. So they, they were destroyed before reaching anything um, of what we consider the current front line. So, so that is definitely good. Um, we know that 92nd was involved in, in, in defending that area. Um, I'm still hoping that Constantine has or receives some some uh, unique footage from there because it's actually promising. And um, Andrew, we, we ordered an image there, but I think it's not there yet, right? Yeah, it has not. So, okay, they go on to talk about the image that they got from there, which suggests that, and I, I presume they're talking about just, just around here, somewhere around here, I think. Uh, we, so there's a couple of things. Well, first of all, the image they got from that was the satellite going over as that attack was taking place, and the satellite image took an image of a tank blowing up or one of the mechanized vehicles blowing up uh, mid-explosion, which is you know quite something. They hadn't seen that so far. So there you go, satellite images catching the war as it happens. What they were saying here, and th this is goes on top of what has been previously said, that the Ukrainians have fire control with drones over all roads around here. And that makes it very difficult for the Russians to do anything. We've already heard many complaints about the Russians that there are really active Ukrainian drones in the skies above all of these areas and that they are having devastating effects on the Russians. The Russians are, have been reduced to using infantry-led attacks mainly up here possibly because they don't have so much mechanized equipment, maybe because it's safer in some ways uh, from being struck by these drones. Well, anyway, they tried a, a five-vehicle attack, or possibly four. They only saw four, uh, Andrew Perpetch and his team, but four vehicles were blown up. So either all of them were blown up or one escaped. Um, but anyway, that was two kilometers behind where the activity is. So those Russian, that Russian attack couldn't even get within two kilometers of the front line there and that shows how incredibly important drones are is that they can spot you there's no surprise attacks anymore really you, you and so therefore it, it will be about numerical advantage about overwhelming the opposition and overwhelming the effect of drones uh, hammering you so here we have four or five vehicles that that gets that get taken out two kilometers from where they need to be fighting how do the Russians cope with this? The Ukrainians have seem to have the drone advantage here, and so they can push that in in terms of helping their own uh, mechanized equipment and troops do the business on the contact line. Um, so that's good news for the Ukrainians. There, anyway. Sorry about that. Uh, about getting that go already going on to Vovchansk. So we're going to go to Vovchansk here, and we were talking about the area and the aggregate plant where the Russians have been supposedly surrounded. It's a little bit unclear as to exactly what the situation is and and whether uh, how many people are in the aggregate plant and whether this is fully surrounded or whether this is just a grey zone that both sides can get into. But what uh, Git was saying in that in a video, again, later in this video, is that had had there been a serious number of uh, Russian troops in that area, you would have expected there to have been evidence of, say, mechanized equipment trying to break through and get those people out. So perhaps there aren't that many Russian troops left here. I mean, it's been a long time that they've supposedly been there, so there will be a lot of attrition. But they, so they were talking about, you know, trying to work out what's going on, and then and then eventually get to this point in the live. So let's. Uh where they are looking at uh, what ends up being a month's worth of data for drone and artillery strikes and the geolocation for all those drones and artillery strikes. Okay, so this is dating back to May 31st. That's the aggregate plant there. And since then, uh, you may notice that there's there's no red in that area. None. Only blue. Only blue attacks. Uh, blue shelling. Blue drones. Blue airstrikes. Um, the the red shelling. The red drones. The red airstrikes are all in like this uh, semicircle around that that plant. 
And what that suggests is that if there, there, are, there are only red strikes in that area, it means that's where the Ukrainians are. So the evidence seems to suggest that the Ukrainians are in this uh, semicircle around here. And that means that those Russians properly are surrounded. At least that it doesn't 100% mean that. I mean, there's a few blue strikes around here, drone strikes around here. But generally, uh, the it does seem that the evidence would suggest that the Russians are surrounded. How many Russians? Who knows? But that, that, was, a, that was an interesting observation. Surat Maps admits that the Russians don't quite control or have been pushed back around the aggregates plant somewhat. And uh, yeah, they've adapted their mapping uh, a tad in that area. Uh, if we go slightly to the east of their Volchansk in the Kharkiv region, the armed forces of Ukraine have completely liberated the eastern part of the settlement, about half a square kilometer. So that's moving over to this area. And in fact, Syriac maps tiny bit of game for, as for as far as deep state maps is concerned just the line would have gone just straight across there uh, they've changed that marginally but uh, Surat maps has got really substantial changes there well you know, quite substantial considering the size of the area uh, where the Russians have been pushed back um, here they say as you can see there particularly uh, the uh, situation here is that Ukrainian army recaptured uh, the a new position northeast of the town of Vovchansk, meanwhile in the centre, and the northern districts so of Russian army captured a new high buildings east of Suborna Street, while Ukrainian forces recaptured new buildings west of the same street. In addition, clashes between both sides continue at the aggregates plant. So there is some slight change there. I probably haven't updated that, actually. That looks like an area I haven't updated. So the claim is that there, there are some changes along this road here, Suborna Street, that the uh, Ukrainians have, yeah, the Ukrainians have taken some area here and the Russians some area there, um, unless that is already on the maps. Anyway, nonetheless, uh, activity happening around here, as you can expect, and the Ukrainians pushing the Russians out of the eastern outskirts of Vovchansk and beyond. Uh, so a good. this is good news for the Ukrainians. Kharkiv seems to be the area where the Russians are suffering the most. Um, we'll see how they cope with that. Maybe this third act, this third sector is part of a kind of distraction uh, project to get the the Ukrainians to move their, um, I guess, meager resources uh, from one problem to another. There. And then, as you can see from the front line, most of what we have are the wrong coloured pins right up and down the front line. We're going to go to the northeastern axis from Kupiansk to Svatova to Kremina and there's a tiny bit of gain for the Russians on a tree line there. The uh, In the um, last few hours says Surat Matt. Um, see that's that's the wrong. That's Liebeke. There's something funky going on here. It's, uh, give me two ticks to sort this out. Yep, that's it. So Surat Maps have just mixed up their their two uh, two mapping descriptions here. So actually, the Hlyobike one was next to this map, which was that the Ukrainian army launched a new attack towards Hlyobike and managed to re-enter some parts of the locality and the northern warehouses in the, in an outflanking movement. So that was that first area we were looking at. And then this is actually the Pischane, um, but I will uh, read that out. So during the past 36 hours, uh, the Russian army made new advances towards Pischane and are close to reaching the southern outskirts of that locality. Uh, so that's Pischane there. So moving along uh, the, this tree line there and um, a little bit of ground along a sort of riverbed uh, there. So small gains for the Russians in that area. No other gains along that whole axis, which is good news for the, uh, for the Ukrainians. Then we come down to Spirna, where the Russians have, according to Surat Mats, made some fairly sweeping gains here. And that is definitely not good news for the Ukrainians. Uh, Surat Mats had, sh had, had re either rejigged or shown a counterattack by the Ukrainians to retake this uh, plant near to the, to the east of Spirna. And then... That seems to have gone completely the other way now. So I don't quite know what was going on there, whether, yeah, I don't know. It's, it only seems to be Surat Maps that have done that. Uh, but anyway, the, the Russians seem to be fully in control of Spirna as according to Surat Maps in that area. So there, 
uh, their um, description is the situation on the Eastern Front. Recent video footage shows a Russian flag uh, raised in the ruins of Spirna. Despite the announcement of the Russian MOD a week ago that the Russian army continued to shell, to shell a retreating Ukrainian army in the following days, following the combing operations and other of the long battles of attrition on the Donbass front, which have been ongoing since summer 2022, came to an end. Uh, so that is a that's a flag that was raised in in one of the uh, one of the houses in Spirna. So that would indicate, at least initially, that the that the Russians have, I guess, at least been there. Um, whether they continually control that, I, I guess we'll see. The other mappers have that as a grey zone with Surat maps. Sorry. Uh, Deep State map and Surat, uh, Andrew Perpetua much further back to the east there, uh, certainly in that village area. So possibly some fairly significant gains, but it might well be that where Surat maps have gone much further back there before, that was an unwarranted kind of overcompensation back that way before then coming back this way. So it's probably that the Russians were in this kind of area where the other mappers had them and then they've taken that rather than all of that area. Anyway, that, that's enough of there. So then we come on no change to Chesif Yar, which is interesting. Now, there are some claims that it is a little bit hairy around Chesif Yar that actually, you know, um, Andrew Perpetua is talking about this in the live stream that, that the northern and southern areas are... A bit touch and go for the Ukrainians. They're fighting over the this canal, uh, literally over the canal. You've got the Ukrainians to the west of the canal and the Russians to the east. The Russians have been the other side of the canal, particularly in this forest area to the south of Chesivia and a little bit up there near Kalinivka. Uh, differing interpretations as to the control uh, for both north and south of the canal micro district, as according to all three mappers there. But it is dynamic and it is certainly very tough for the Ukrainians. The Euro might impress, uh, as they often do, they talk about um, uh, reporting from Ukraine's sort of videos and whatnot, and that looks like one of their visuals, yeah, by reporting from Ukraine. Uh, so, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. They're usually pretty good reporting from Ukraine. But um, yeah, current assault uh, force in Chesiv Antonietsk can only last for a few months before being exhausted and withdrawn from battle due to ill-prepared infantry, some with as little as a week and a half of training uh, and heavy losses of tanks and armored vehicles due to effective Ukrainian drone attacks. So this is uh, painting a difficult picture for the Russians. Uh, and of course, that may well be true. But what the Russians do is they overcompensate for, you know, poorly trained troops and lack of equipment by just throwing more and more of them in there. Um, so, yeah, the, it talks, uh, they talk about the assault on Kalinivka village, Russians having low morale in the area, uh, decrease in Russian weapons and equipment. Um, a Russian Storm Z instructed claim that Russian forces made their most significant gains in Chelsea Yard, Avdivka and Ochiratina through attritional frontal assaults, yep, airstrikes, yep, and artillery without any advances on the flanks. These assaults result in the loss of significant numbers of armoured vehicles during intensified mechanised operations. Um, Deputy Head of the Presidential Office Roman Mashevets stated that the number of available tanks for Russian forces in Chelsea Yard, Siversky and Korakova directions has significantly decreased to 650 tanks. He also noted that the the number of combat ready armored fighting vehicles is now just 1850 and this goes along with what i've been reporting in my daily uh, losses video the first video of the day saying these unsustainable losses and the change of russian behavior seems to indicate that they are indeed churning through their stocks and they are running short of some of these critical vehicles why we are this why we are seeing them use motorbikes and quads and golf buggies and tracked garden sheds etc etc for context russians have lost over 15,000 and armoured vehicles and 8,000 tanks since the start of the war. Of course, that would be general star figures and around a dozen of each are lost daily. This indicates that the current assault forces can only last a few months before being exhausted and withdrawn from battle and then talks about high casualties among the Russian troops, so on and so forth. So that's painting a difficult picture for Russia in the area, but it is probably belying the situation for the Ukrainians, which is pretty critical for those. Although they were su supposed to, scare quotes, quotes, supposed to have lost Chazivyar by this stage already, or certainly by the end of summer, and it's not looking like that will happen, but it could well happen, and that would lead on to attacks uh, further to the, well, probably slightly southwest towards Kostantinivka. And the worry that about Kostantinivka, so although Chazivyar is a concern, of course it is, 
uh, and this was the, the main point of attack for the Russians and had been planned on for some time to the point where the Ukrainians had dug in there and and it's all rather well defended over here against this uh, Russian attack uh, against this crescent of uh, cities and towns. It, it, the problem is developing further to the south where in New York and in Turetsk, the Russians are now properly having some success where they previously weren't and it wasn't looking like they were going to. So the, this was along the 2014 uh, front line, really, in that part, in that, that neck of the woods. And the Ukrainians have been sat there defending perfectly well, thank you very much. But then there was a possibly a rotation of two units at a time. Big mistake by the Ukrainians. Russians took advantage and now they're just pushing on. And at the same time that they're doing this, they're also starting to hammer the crap out of all the, of these towns behind with their artillery, aviation, so on and so forth. So you're starting to get widespread civilian losses around here. Andrew Perpetua has been railing consistently about uh, the horrific tactics of the Russians of just slamming uh, ordnance into these places that where you got old ladies sitting out in in town centres on benches getting killed and maimed, uh, and it's just terrible. The Russians are just going through their usual process of flattening places before they take them over. That will be happening to Turetsk, sadly enough, uh, and as as it is no doubt to New York at the moment, which was fairly. I mean, declared close to the front line they have been for a long time but have been fairly sort of safe not safe because it would get sort of a lot of artillery attention uh, but now it's all looking rather hairy for the uh, for the Ukrainians there so when we look at this sector um yeah well we we'll first go up to a slight change in and around not Klitschivka but the other side of the the railway line the other side of a couple of these um reservoirs or, or ponds or whatever the Russians have made a slight gain there this could be not a gain recently but just evidence of them actually being in that position that would make sense anyway I mean goodness me you look at what uh Surat Maps has which is the Russians controlling bleeding everything over here including Klitschivka and including the trench uh, the trench system to the north west of Klitschivka and all of this land over there none of the other mappers have that so you know it's a vast difference this is one of the biggest areas of biggest differences between the mappers here and Syria maps being super uh, super charitable to Russia anyway possibly some small changes for Russia up there and then we come down to the Mayorsk area where the Russians are pushing uh, further to the north to try and take all of this area to the east of the canal which you would expect them to do right they've got to the east of the canal all the way up to Kurdi and Mivka here and uh, th that that's likely going to be under Russian control very soon um, because it'll be difficult for the Ukrainians to keep supplying across that that um, canal and then they're moving on the railway line as you can see here uh, Surat Maps has this area of land so this is the these pins were where the lines previously were for Surat Maps so that's them having all of this and then for Deep State Maps they had the line previously going here so some widespread gains um, all around here for the Russians for for both mappers really, uh, and that is uh, that is really concerning for the Ukrainians there as as the Russians move towards Pivnitchne or in Pivnitchne uh, sorry uh, further into there towards Druzba along that railway line, uh, and then further to the south in the kind of pincer movement as they have two flanks uh, working through uh, Zalizhne here this one and into Pivichne, uh, Pivnichne sorry, from the south all the time moving towards Turetsk uh, proper. Um, all three mappers have some gains. Surat maps only some tiny gains here just like literally one one high-rise building there on the edge of um, uh, Pivnichne or Turetsk uh, but the other mappers catching up with Surat maps and saying Andrew Perpetua and Deep State Map saying yep okay they do control all of this so this might not be that that's been a gain in the last 24 hours Surat maps already had that and now the other two mappers are agreeing with the evidence there okay uh, then when we come down into the New York area the Russians are according to Andrew Perpetua he agrees now that, that Surat maps was uh, correct with the early claim that uh, the Russians had moved up into New York. There's evidence now to uh, properly support that claim. This is very concerning. Indeed, uh, Deep State Maps has that as well, but I don't have the Deep State Map line. It's, it's a, we're, we're just adding slowly Deep State Map into 
uh, all of the front lines. So eventually we have three lines. We were previously only using deep state map in a couple of places like Chazi, uh, like Bakhmut and Abdivka because they were the like flashpoints. And then over time we've been sort of filling in the gaps. And now we have deep state map the yellow line over most of the front line. This is just one of, one of the few areas we haven't joined up some of those fronts so that that will no doubt happen soon but they also show that too that's definitely concerning around here because um and andrew perpetu was talking about this last night if you start getting a fight over kostantinivka that is huge uh in the same way that if this road here gets interdicted that's a big challenge you know th these are much more significant than the grinding uh gains that they make in some places on the front line and indeed, the, you know, the grinding games in Chazif Yar, you know, this was expected, but this wasn't so much expected further to the south. And indeed, Abdivka wasn't really expected because it all kind of capitulated rather too quickly. Now, as you can see here, some gains all across this uh, northern part of the whole salient here. Uh, Surat maps having slightly less uh, in terms of gains, but they, they are usually either ahead of the curve or much more charitable for the Russians and claim that they've made gains and consolidated those gains much earlier than the other mappers. The other mappers wait, see if they definitely do control that and then make the changes. Whereas Surat Maps is a little bit gung-ho there. But nonetheless, small changes for Surat Maps and then some much larger sweeping changes for the other mappers, showing that the Russians really are uh, moving towards this POC res uh, in a westerly direction, but interestingly, not quite moving. And Andrew Perpetu was talking about this the other day, saying he had expected them to have interdicted this T040, T0504 highway by now, and they haven't. So there are there are there are lots of there's lots of examples of how Russia are making a really really slow going, making a real meal out of the advances they are making. And then there are other other examples like this that, that are somewhat are surprising where they suddenly make considerable gains. And these are the more concerning ones. Um, anyway, further down to the set. Oh, let's have a look. Well, what do we have here? Um, OK, so that is that's uh, in this area here. Uh, that's there, Voskhod. So Voskhod is that settlement uh, just south of Yevhenivka on the southern part of that northern salient that we're talking about. And here, the Russian army advanced west and southwest of Voskhod, thus developing the flanking of Novosiliska per Persia from the north. So this is Novosiliska Persia, and they could be trying to operationally surround that settlement, um, which you would pretty much expect, I guess. Uh, and then when we come down to Krasnoharivka, we have deep state maps showing that the Russians have made some some gains there, but that's more in line with what Surat Maps and Andrew Perpetua had already previously said, so nothing too uh, out of the ordinary there. And actually, that's, that's the whole of it for the front line in terms of what the mappers have claimed. Uh, again, you know, yes, there are some definite concerns for the Ukrainians, but there are also, there is also evidence that the Russians don't have all that much considering this is supposed to be you know if you're the russian army right and the whole point of you being in ukraine is to take ukraine territory right you have the second greatest army in the world you, this is not it shouldn't be a problem that all is going well right if you if you're a russian troll you're sitting there saying yeah we're all great we're fine we're, we're brilliant russians are awesome yay you would just be like waltzing through the land but you're not you're thinking Everything is so difficult, everything is so slow, and everything is so costly. And it's empirically evidenced that it is costly because we are seeing on a daily basis huge numbers of losses. And then there's Andrew Perpetua's released his loss list again today, just, just fairly recently, actually. And yeah, just challenging for the, for the Russians. So this is not easy for them. They're just getting away with this because mass and a care and a lack of care for human lives means that they can just throw people and dwindling equipment stocks in terms of quality and quantity at the Ukrainians and that they can overcome the Ukrainians in that way. Now, as a, just a couple of points to make in the South, this is I've no idea whether this is true. I've not seen this mentioned by anyone else. It's just a random uh, source here saying that the Ukrainians have advanced into Krinky again. 
And you're thinking, really? Uh, have they? Like, I don't know, right? But just throwing that out there, that there is a claim that the Ukrainians are doing that. Now, there are widespread fires all going on around here. Where, as the Ukrainians have hit Russian ammunition depots and whatnot, and that has sparked fires, and the Russians are probably in quite a bit of trouble here in terms of logistics and troops running away from fires and all sorts of chaos. And it could be that the Ukrainians could, might think about taking some kind of advantage of that uh, opportunistically but you know if you're going to start going to the other side of the river again and trying to trying to achieve a bridgehead it, it is that's a high risk strategy um, and I don't quite know what the value of that would be because previously the value was in destroying Russian equipment that was brought in to stop that bridgehead but they've kind of learnt that now the Russians lost so much equipment and personnel that actually what really got rid of the, the people here in, in Krinky was the attack up in Kharkiv. So the attack up in Kharkiv got the U Ukrainians to panic. They moved their uh, a few of their um, units up from here to Kharkiv and then eventually pulled out Krinky because they, they basically only had, was it one of the four um, uh, brigades that was there, I think, left. Uh, and so they, they pulled out of Krinky. But it wasn't because they were pushed out of Krinky. But they they had to redeploy those troops elsewhere. That was more uh, there was more advantage to defending in Kharkiv than there was to stay in Krinky. So yeah, point is doubtful, but who knows? Uh, and that said, uh, no reports talks about that massive fire or those massive fires. If you look at the firm's data, it spread right across that area of Kherson, occupied left bank of the Dnipro. Uh, recently, the Ukrainian armed forces have carried out precise strikes. Um, destroying Russian antennas, bunkers and other positions, resulting in significant losses. The left bank of the Kherson region is quickly becoming a graveyard for, for them. Uh, I won't play this anymore, but there's just massive fires going on back here. It's sadly becoming a graveyard for nature as well, uh, and, and animals and plant, plant life in the area. But it is just, yeah, hugely challenging for the Russians. So again, going back to that previous point, it could be that the Ukrainians might want to take advantage of that. Um, uh, but uh, I, I, I don't know whether they have the breadth of forces down there to be able to do that. But something to think about, watch out for. Uh, anyway, that's enough of uh, me for now. I'm going to get on and do a quick uh, geopolitical update. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, please like, subscribe and share. Take care. Speak soon. Toodle pips.